This is Andy Young of the Preserve Maine Traditions. Andy, thank you for coming in tonight. Thank you. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, just a quick, uh, Preserve Maine Traditions is a, a group dedicated to preserving Maine traditions and in, in their traditional use and way of life with, uh, with, with the lands. Um, we're a group dedicated uh, for many walks of life, united in defeating uh, what we consider a misguided proposal from Restore and Roxanne Quimby. Uh, you know, a lot of the people I've talked to who are in favor of parks ask questions like, you know, who doesn't like national parks? Uh, why would anyone not want a new park on donated land? Uh, there's plenty of land up there. It's only 70,000 acres. Why would anyone turn down such a gift? Uh, you know, for many that ask these questions, it seems impossible to believe that anyone uh, would not be in favor of these proposals. Uh, but the reality is much deeper than what shows on the surface uh, of the most recent proposal put forth by Restore and Roxanne Quimby. Um, my personal connection to the lands that are, are currently being discussed goes back 40 years. Uh, I first started using those lands when I was eight years old. My father and his friends would take me up there and we'd go fishing and hiking, camping. And, and, and it's an area that it holds a lot of memories for me and, and an area that I went and, and had a lot of uh, fun times. Um, and my journey on this issue around this national park started about three years ago when uh, talking to Joe and Sue Christensen at the Matagammon Wilderness Campground. Uh, I asked them the question, because I, I was wondering myself, you know, why wouldn't you be in favor of, of this park? Uh, and after 20 minutes of a pretty passionate, one-sided conversation, uh, what basically was left, you know, was, you know, why would you people take away our livelihood? Why would you change, you know, what we've had up here for generations, the way we try to make money and earn a living? Um, you know, and uh, the last thing he told me, he looked at me and he goes, Joe said, he goes, if you think this is just 70,000 acres, you got a lot to learn. Um, you know, and uh, what became came for me, that harmless question, you know, began for me looking into the issue, seeing what it was, uh, and, and starting to realize that this, this had very little to do with 70,000 acres. This was a part of a 25-year uh, proposal uh, that went back and encompassed, you know, a third of the, of the main forest land. Um, enough so that, you know, if it was to become reality, it would basically stifle and destroy the, the forest industry. Uh, we're talking 30 to 40,000 people in a belt that surround from Greenville to Millinocket to Patton, whose livelihoods are dependent um, on those forest lands. Um, you know, I, uh, my background, I'll tell you right now, I'm a liberal Democrat. Um, I, th this issue seems to bring this thing that, well, this must be a Republican or, or a property rights people versus, and the answer is no. I mean, you've got union people and business leaders in opposition to this. You've got Democrats and Republicans in opposition to this. You've got back to the landers and property rights advocates in, you know, in opposition to this proposal. Um, you know, it, 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 it's broad based because, you know, for the majority of the people in northern Maine, to them this is craziness. Uh, and as I began looking at this issue, uh, you can see the, the placards we have up and we have handouts too. Uh, at the back of the room, you can see there's, there's 22 statements there that dot the historical record of Restore and Roxanne Quimby over the last 22 years. Uh, and the statements, and, and especially the last 12 years, where what we're talking about with this park and this proposal, even though it's masqueraded up as just 70,000 acres, uh, is a part of a much bigger agenda. Uh, and just that change in tactics uh, does not mean a change in agenda. Um, uh, I'm not a paranoid delusionalist here. I, I don't sit here and make these things up. Every one of those things has documentation, and if anybody wants them, uh, you put your name down and we'll send you the documentation on them. Um, with that, uh, Part of the, what we're going to be doing tonight is, is talking about what is working. Uh, another thing I hear from a lot of people is, you know, uh, if, if you read the letters to the editor or look at the websites or talk to people, it's like, well, National Park would be great. People could go camping. Well, there's over a thousand campsites in northern Maine you can go use right now. About half of them you don't even have to pay for. They're between the joint working relationship between the Maine Forest Service and the landowners. Uh, <clears throat> the whole northern part of Maine from uh, Telos up, you know, you've, you've got the North Main Woods Association, which has, you know, a, a cooperative venture between all the landowners to provide access to the land. Public access already exists. Uh, you know, what we have in Maine is unparalleled in the country. 
as far as public access goes. Uh, and if you want any proof of that, uh, we have a website called PreserveMainTraditions.com. I have somebody counting how many plugs we put in for that. So, uh, just you know, it's a uh, three. <laughs> that's three. Well, that's the first time I said the dot com. <laughs> So, uh, and on there, I mean, there's a lot of information on there showing, you know, you know, current usage of the North Woods. Um, as I say, my roots using it go back 40 years. And uh, the ability to use the North Woods now, it's open to anybody who wants to use it. You know, and uh, to this date, the only lands that have been shut down are those owned by Roxanne Quimby. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to these two gentlemen. They have a lot of history working uh, of, of the use of the Northern Forest and... And we have Bob Myers from the Maine Snowmobile Association and Jim Robbins, who's CEO of and owner of uh, Robbins Lumber. Good. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, and uh, thanks for coming, everybody. I always feel kind of funny at these things. I've done a number of these forums before, and I'm, I'm glad you didn't say what people normally say was speaking against the park. I, you know, I, I hate standing up and saying I'm against something. What I really am is in favor of something else and something that seems to work pretty well, uh, which is outdoor rec recreation in Maine. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Maine Snowmobile Association. We have about 25,000 individuals and 2,000 businesses that uh, are associated with us through our clubs all over the state. And they maintain 14,500 miles of trail, weather permitting, uh, uh, all over the state. And uh, it's a wonderful activity, a great group of people. They're all volunteers. And their efforts and also the generosity of private landowners in the state uh, fuel an industry that's valued at about $350 million a year. Uh, we also provide the full-time equivalent of about 2,300 jobs statewide. So we're just one small segment of outdoor recreation in Maine. And uh, I've got a little presentation here to talk. Outdoor recreation in Maine is a byproduct of productive commercial forest and agricultural lands. And uh, by byproduct, I mean we're a secondary use. Nobody buys land to manage for snowmobiling. They buy farms, they operate farms, they operate forest lands. And uh, that picture on the right there that you can see is uh, the logging truck. That's a snowmobile trail. That's a snowmobile trail that's currently out of use because the landowner is cutting wood in there and hauling it out. And uh, they work with the local clubs, and in, in this case, they rerouted the trail in a different location. And uh, this allows the landowners to get their product out of the, uh, out of the woods. 94% of the state's land area is privately owned, and more than 10 million acres of working farms and forests are open to the public. This voluntary contribution by landowners needs to be understood and respected by everybody who ventures outdoors. And this can be forest landowners and farmers and land trusts and, and other private landowners. Landowners buy land for all kinds of reasons. And like I said, very few are buying it just for recreational purposes. And Maine is very lucky in that we have a unique arrangement. Uh, we have a history of public access to private land. Uh, that is really found nowhere else in the country. Uh, some of you who uh, may be from other states know that uh, there are private hunting preserves, there are places in, in this country where snowmobile clubs pay by the mile for, uh, to use trails in the winter time. Um, and, and land is pretty much locked up tight. The thing that keeps things going in Maine is number one, this tradition that we've had, which is fantastic, but also Maine has responded uh, and has enacted laws to protect landowners. Uh, Maine has, uh, a, uh, excuse me, a law called the uh, Recreational Access and Harvesting Law, Title 14, Section 159A, which basically holds landowners harmless if anybody's recreating on their land, whether they have permission or not. And um, it preserves this access, it provides protection to landowners, and it is just a terrific arrangement. And the result of all this secondary use is really impressive. Hunting and fishing generates $498 million a year in Maine. Snowmobiling, $300 million a year. ATVing, $200 million a year. That's $998 million bucks. 
and it doesn't even count wildlife watching, bird watching, hiking, camping. Uh, as Andy mentioned, there's over a thousand campsites that are available to people throughout the state. Now they call them Forest Service campsites, that's because back in the good old days, the Forest Service used to maintain those. And people, you get your campfire permit, and you go and find these campsites out in the woods, and it was pretty much yours to use at no charge. Well, as you know, states had budget problems forever, and a long time ago, they stopped paying the Forest Service to maintain these sites. Sites are still there. Landowner picks up a lot of that. All these activities create thousands of jobs statewide and support countless small businesses in addition to the manufacturing jobs that are supported by the working forest and uh, <coughs> agriculture in the state. There is a cost to private landowners in offering this access to their property, and most of those costs are not recovered. Uh, in the few cases where there is some kind of cost passed on to recreationists, it's nominal at best. I, I included this picture. I think this is really neat. This is uh, on the road up by, uh oh, where's my technical person? Um, this is a gatehouse for North Main Woods. They gate some of their roads and access is provided by the landowners there and North Main Woods has been hired to manage the uh, recreational access. They have thousands of miles of private roads that are available to uh, recreationists. But this is a great example. This is a remote access point and as you can see it's solar powered. There's a gate there. It has a video hookup that's connected by satellite internet access. And so you drive out in the middle of the woods, I mean you can't get a cell signal for about 35, 40 miles. And all of a sudden you come upon this and you walk up and there's someone's face looking at you on a TV screen and it kind of freaks you out a little bit. But uh, that's a low cost way of, of maintaining access and, and control of access to their lands. There's hundreds of campsites up there. People go up and hunt and they snowmobile and in the wintertime these gates are open uh, and uh, really enjoy themselves. All private landowners expect in return for allowing access is that visitors respect their property and clean up after themselves. And, uh, you know, unfortunately this is an example of uh, how some people choose to uh, use someone else's land. Um, I know I met someone here from the land trust. I'm sure you've never seen this happen before. Um, and many recreation groups work at doing cleanups. We work with the Maine Forest Service and, and other state agencies uh, trying to uh, keep property clean. And private ownership, of course, means local management and control of Maine's forest lands. Um, a lot of times we hear people saying, well, the, the North Woods is changing so much and so much land has changed hands. And that's true. But generally, when investors are buying these lands um, and uh, continuing to maintain, they're maintaining the forest, uh, the timber contracts, and, and maintaining them as working forests. They hire main companies to manage those lands. They're hiring main loggers and foresters. And of course, a lot of this wood is going to main mills uh, to produce paper and, and uh, forest products, uh, lumber and things like that. <clears throat> in addition, when you get up in the North Woods, over 1,640,000 acres of land in Maine are already protected. And they're protected from development by conservation easements. This allows uh, the landowner to realize some value from their property and at the same time allows them to continue maintaining it for its primary use, whether forestry operations or, or things like that. In most cases, this land is open for recreational use. And this is a picture I'm going to leave up for a while. This is what we're talking about tonight. Uh, the area in pink is the proposed national park. They gave me a little pointer here. Um, this is the east branch of the Penobscot River that goes down through here. This is Baxter State Park. With, yeah. Right down here is Whetstone Bridge, which is basically the only road access into here. And this, this yellow line here is a snowmobile trail that goes up through here. Um, this is the area in contention. And 
doesn't sound like much, 70,000 acres, and in reality, some of it still is not owned by Roxanne Quimby, so it's, it's really about 58,000 acres. But um, this is a real example of how a relatively small parcel of land, when you look at the big picture, can create tremendous problems. And uh, hopefully, uh, clearer heads will prevail and something will happen. Uh, has anybody ever been up in this area? A couple, quite a few. Baxter mm -hmm. Park, been fishing in the East Branch. They have great trout fishing <coughs> up there. It's a great place to canoe. Um, and unfortunately, in the past number of years, as, as the ownership has changed, uh, a lot of that land, the <coughs> access has been blocked to it, other, other than foot access. And so it's difficult for people to get in, it's difficult for people to enjoy, and uh, quite honestly, we don't see any way that having the federal government take it over is going to improve the situation. Because as soon as the federal government owns it, the land is out of local control. It's out of our hands, no matter what kind of promises are made and what kind of guarantees are made. Um, things are handled in Washington, D.C. Uh, I can tell you, as a snowmobiler, uh, organized snowmobiling has been fighting battles over access in Yellowstone National Park for about 20 years now. And Yellowstone, obviously, is millions and millions of acres more than this. And uh, this year, and just about every year, they have new rules regarding snowmobiling. Uh, some snowmobilers consider it a major victory because they're allowed to bring 375 snowmobiles a day into Yellowstone National Park. And that's dispersed over, I don't know how many millions of acres of land it is. Uh, it's been as, as little as zero some years. And so people get concerned about that. And they look at this and say, this is the same thing that's happening here. And uh, obviously, it bothers the heck out of all of us. So I think I'm going to turn it over to my friend Jim now, and he can talk from the perspective of the forest products industry, which they are the guys that own the land up there, and in my opinion, doing a great job. And <coughs> the yellow lines right here. This piece of land right here, uh, the state purchased an easement from Roxanne Quimby uh -huh. uh, that we have been negotiating for a number of years for a, an easement for a recreational trail. Um, as part of the same deal, it was going to be this trail also, and uh, unfortunately they couldn't get together on a price. And so we have this to Whetstone Bridge, and then we have use this year only, uh -huh. as of right now. And it's entirely up to Roxanne whether she'll keep that open in the future. So there's uh, no through trail, permanently? No. No. And, and we don't expect that. I, you know, we, we tend to shy away from buying easements, number one, because they're very expensive. And in, in this case, uh, the state was paying her about $24,000 a mile. Um, Prior and to that, did you have access? Yes. Yes. Um, for about 20 years. <coughs> And it just, uh, these are the type of things that uh, really disrupt what's going on up there. This, this trail, this snowmobile trail, is ITS 85, which is a major north-south route. Um, and it's up in the high country, and uh, it gets a lot of snow. And uh, I can tell you, you, go up there right now, there's about uh, three and a half, four feet of snow on the ground. And it's a beautiful place to snowmobile. Um, we certainly respect Roxanne's right as a private landowner to shut off snowmobiling, uh, prevent hunting, uh, and, and which is what she has done on, on most of this land. But at the same time, over the years, this outdoor recreation that takes place, there's been businesses that built up about it. Andy mentioned the, um, the Matagaming campground and store. Uh, they're right by the north gate of Baxter Park. Uh, the snowmobile trail goes up and goes old and probably to about there and used to land right in their backyard. That's all gone now. And so they're really struggling in the wintertime. When you go up there, sometimes you'd be 100 sleds in the parking lot, uh, people buying gas, people buying lunch, uh, which allowed him to remain open year round and hire people and create jobs and uh, you know build business in the area. 
Uh, farther down in the Chin Pond area, there's a number of businesses that have been adversely affected, not just by the loss of snowmobiling access, but also loss of hunting and, and bear hunting and, and other activities. And uh, we find it really disturbing. Mm -hmm. Yes? I have another question about the map. Sure. Um, the area in pink is the proposed national park. Well, actually, this is Roxanne's ownership. Um, and All this stuff in pink. In pink. And, and since, since this map was made, she's bought about another 12,000 acres to the east of this. But <laughs> the park would be right between Baxter Park and the East Branch. So it would be this land right in here. And as you can see, there's a little bump out there where the Catan Lake uh, land was purchased a number of years back. The Bureau of Parks and Lands owns, owns a stretch of land up here, which is virtually impossible to get to by foot um, because it, it's very overgrown up through the Wasada Cook Valley. And the state also owns a, a small strip of land in the township just north of Whetstone Bridge. Could I point out something on that map? Sure. Um, this piece of land right up here that b between the two ownerships is owned by Pennis and Carlisle, a land management company now the main 6,500 acres and uh, we Robbins Lumber Company also owns a lot of land uh, up in Northern Maine and all of the, the landowners up there let each other we have common roads that go across each other's land you give each other permits to haul the wood out and uh, they own 6,500 acres and the only way into that land is across a piece of land on the top of the picture that she bought and she now won't let them go across her land when they cut their wood so they can't harvest their wood so she's got them landlocked, and, and so they've got 6,500 acres they can't do anything with. And because she wants to buy it, and she's trying to force them to sell to her by not letting them have access to it, and get the wood out. And that isn't just to me, you know, that isn't the way Maine people treat each other. And I think that's an absolute shame. And uh, Boland Pond camps are right across the river from that spot, and uh, they have a hunting and fishing camp, and they host snowmobiles and so forth. And uh, a lot of their recreation used to take part on that side of the river until she bought it. And now she won't let them use it, so uh, they've lost all of that. The, uh, the snowmobile trail used to run right down the west side of the river. And it, it <clears throat> crossed the highway up at the Matagammon store and uh, came down through there. There were a number of camps along there that uh, were on leased land, uh, first with Great Northern Paper Company and then with Irving, who uh, sold the land to uh, Elliottsville Plantation. And when Elliottsville Plantation bought the land, they terminated all the leases um, and, and basically told people they're going to have to get out and take their stuff and leave. Um, there was a desire on Elliottville Plantation's part that there were some very historic cabins along that, um, along the river there. And um, they wanted to keep those, but they wanted to get rid of the people who were occupying them. And so uh, once the leases were terminated, everybody moved out. Uh, Sadly, a number of the camp owners burned their camps when they left, or they tore them down. Uh, there's still a few up there, and uh, but they are unoccupied now. Yes? Uh, I, I totally go along with somebody who owns a piece of land. They should have the right to do it, what they want with it. Mm -hmm. But I also feel that if you're going to put that land into tree growth, and have the rest of us taxpayers subsidize your taxes so that you can own a lot of land, they should give up the right to post that land. Well, I'll, I'll let Jim get into the tree growth part. I, it, it's a tricky issue. I, the whole thing is a tricky issue. You know, I, and I've got to tell you, I know Roxanne pretty well. Uh, I first started meeting with her shortly after she bought her big piece of land up and, and started this about nine years ago. Uh, I've met with her many times and uh, we've had a lot of conversations. We certainly both know where each other stands on this issue. Um, and I have a lot of respect for her. She's an intelligent person. Uh, she's been a tremendously successful business person. Um, but I think she's dead wrong on this one. And uh, she would always say to me, well, what about my rights as a landowner? And, and I agree, she has every right as a private landowner to do everything she's done. But then when you start talking about giving it to the government, it becomes everybody's business. And that's where we are now. Oh. It, it's kind of interesting. And actually, you know, 
people are terribly concerned about people go in and, and cut land off and then sell it for development, things like that. And that really doesn't happen a whole lot. Um, and certainly the way conservation easements and things are structured you can do that. But quite honestly, Roxanne has created a whole new metric. And basically there are some landowners out there who will buy a piece of land and they will cut it to within an inch of the law. And then they'll sell it to her for what they paid for it. And she's a willing buyer and she's paying big bucks for no forest, land that no forest manager with any sense would ever go near because it's had 50 years worth of wood taken out of it. Um, and that's, that's the new metric. It's yeah, and, and that is the new metric ready. that she's created. Yeah. And, and it's almost the like this she then turns around and buys they know bulk liquidation it. harvesting. Well, somebody's going to be buying it. Well, she's buying it. Yeah, but don't forget, that land grows back. It, it, yeah, it, it does grow back. You know, 30 years there's going to be wood there again. Yeah. Wood is renewable. That's the great thing about it. And that's one thing she doesn't seem to recognize. Anyway, I know. Well, thank you. I guess I'm on there. Go to um, it. Let me just address that. You know, there are main forest practices laws that you're aren't allowed to clear up more than 20 acres without permits from the main forest and with a reforestation plan. And uh, it may be cut down to the minimum basal area that the state law allows, but it isn't totally flattened. But even if it is, you know, all of the state of Maine has been totally harvested many, many times. Trees grow back and balsam fir is about a 40 year cycle, white pine you're talking about a 100 year cycle. But anyway, that, I didn't really come here tonight to talk about forestry. Uh, Andy asked me to come down and talk to people tonight about the uh, proposed Maine Woods National Park. Let me just tell you a little bit about myself first. Uh, I'm Jim Robbins, I live in Searsmont, it's my wife Ann. Um, Searsmont, if you're not familiar with the area, just behind these mountains of Camden. Uh, my family has settled in that area in the 1700s and uh, we've had a, been in the mill business there for 130 years, and we employ a little over 100 people there to do some eastern white pine products. And uh, we own about 28,000 acres of timberland, and uh, we're very proud of the way we manage that land. And in fact, this last year we won the uh, Austin Wilkins Award for being the outstanding land steward of the state of Maine. I have a degree in forestry. I love to hunt and fish and canoe and snowmobile when I have snow. And um, I really love the Maine woods. It's been my life all my life and uh, for many generations in my family. I want to start off by saying I'm not opposed to national parks. I've had the privilege of traveling around this country quite a bit. And I was counting up last night, I think I've been to 18 different national parks. And I've been to Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, Teton, Teddy Roosevelt, and Glacier. All of those I've been to many, many times. And every one of those parks I've been to are spectacular, and I absolutely love them. And I spent a summer working at Teton National Forest, which is in between Teton National Park and Yellowstone Park. And I love those parks. But I can tell you right now that, you know, those are spectacular. This area is not. There's nothing spectacular about her land. Now, she shows you a slideshow, a lot of aerial photos, which look beautiful from the air. But have you ever seen a place in Maine that isn't beautiful from the air? We're far <coughs> from an extremely beautiful state, and it all looks great from the air. But you get down on the ground on her land, and it's mostly cut over timberland. And, but you're going to have trouble seeing it because all those logging roads that we've been talking about, she's pulled all the culverts and the bridges out of them so people can't get in there. And it goes back to what I was saying also on that map about Prentice and Carlisle can no longer get their wood off that land because she removed the bridges and roads and she won't let them do it if she did have the bridges and roads there. But, you know, the, the beauty in that area is in Baxter Park and what she's proposing is just north and east of Baxter Park. And Baxter Park is truly beautiful. But her land is nothing different than most of the rest of Northern Maine, which is nice land, but it's not spectacular like you'd like to think of the National Park would be. It uh, does have a nice set of falls on the river, uh, Grand Pitch. I was salmon fishing up there last summer. I fished it many times. It's a beautiful river, but there's tons of beautiful rivers all over the state and all over the country. And we have that accessibility to it now to enjoy without it becoming a National Park. If you get on the ground, like I said, it's very, very hard to see because it is cut over timberland. And she said, we had a meeting with her one day in the Maine Park Spotters Council, and she said, well, it's not going to produce timber anyway because it's been cut over. But don't forget, wood is, is a wonderful renewable resource. And we've been cutting trees here in Maine for over 200 years, and there's more wood growing here now than there was in the 1800s because it is renewable. So that land still has an awful lot of value. 
70,000 acres, though, in our opinion, is just the nose of the camel under the tent. Because once she gets that 70,000 acres established, for a long time now, Restore has been trying to create a 3.2 million acre park in northern Maine, which would destroy most of the timber industry in Maine. And, you know, she has been on their board. She isn't on their board now, but she is co-chair. If you, if you look at their website, which is a national park, the Maine Woods National Park and Preserve, the website lists her as being co-chair. And they are very adamant about they want a 3.2 million acre park. So we feel if she gets that 70,000 acres established, it's just gonna be the nose of the camel under the tent, and that pack, they're gonna make every effort they can to grow that into a much bigger pack, which then threatens the wood supply of the mills in Maine. Now you say, well, why do I care down here in Salesmont? You know, our mill's only 15 miles from here, and her land is, is a long ways from here. And everybody's been worried about the paper mills in Millinocket, whether or not they're gonna have wood for those mills. But I can tell you that mills all over the state of Maine get logs out of that area and get wood out of there. We get a lot of logs out of the Patton area, which is when you turn off to go to that pack, going in by Shin Pond, you turn off Route 11 in Patton. And uh, Hugh owns a lot of land up through there, Penascala owns a lot of land. And we get a lot of logs right here at our mill in Sizemont from that area. Hardwood logs go to the Hardwood Mills of Maine. There's one in Portage, there's one in Solon. The spruce goes to the mills in Ashland and in Dover Foxcroft. And so there's, there's not just the paper mills in Millinocket that are being affected. Okay? We need to also look at the big picture. The population of the world is increasing tremendously. And with that population growth, is the demand for wood and paper is also increasing. I think we can no longer afford singular uses of pieces of land. We need to have multiple use. There's no reason that we can't have recreation on that land and production of wood fiber to meet the products that we all use every day. Every one of us uses a lot of, a lot of wood fiber every day, whether it's toilet paper, a newspaper, or lumber for your house, or flooring, or your furniture. We all use wood, and we're going to be using more of it as our population continues to increase. And we have it all in Maine right now. We have the recreation. We have the wood supply. Uh, Maine has a unique tradition in that almost all the land in the state of Maine, except for Roxanne Quimby's, is available to the public for use. And it's like she's taking 70,000 acres off the grid and holding us hostage to make it a national park. And she's agreed that she'll give us another 40,000 acres on the east side of the river for snowmobiling and, and uh, general uses. But it's kind of like someone giving you, you know, say you've got 70 bucks, and someone comes out and says, well, I'm going to take 70 bucks from you, but I, I, I'm going to give you back 40, and that's supposed to be a good deal for you. Well, I don't see it that way. She's taking 70,000 acres out of production and saying she's going to give us back 40,000 that we can use, but we already have that 40,000 to use now, and we had the 70,000 to use for multiple uses, including timber production, until she bought it. Another thing we need to look at is how much park land do we need? In the United States today, if you add up the total acreage of national parks, wilderness preserves, and refuges where no timber harvesting is done, that's 266 million acres. Let me repeat that, that's 266 million acres. That's 13.3 times the size of the entire state of Maine. Okay, I mean that is just an unbelievably big area. How much more do we need? Maine also happens to be one of the best areas in the world for growing timber. We have great soils, we have a great climate. Some people may debate that in the winter, but most of us think we have a great climate. It's a great climate for growing trees. You know, out west, they have a lot of land, but they don't have the water we do. We've got the soils, we've got the water, we've got the climate. And when you've got one of the best areas in the world for producing timber, we ought to be producing timber, not tying it up for singular use. And if you want to give it to the federal government, well, where's the poorest managed land in the country? It is owned by the federal government. You can read all year long about the forest fires that take place out west. And almost all of those fires are on federally owned land, mostly in the pack land where they don't allow any timber harvesting. That's because the trees get old and die, thunder shower comes along, <coughs> lightning hits them, and away you go. You may remember the National Pack fire that happened in Yellowstone a few years ago. It burned over 800,000 acres. And I was chairman of the American Forestry Council at that time, and we'd written to the National Park Service and said, you have got a big problem in your national parks, your timber's all dying, and if you don't harvest it, you're going to have some major fires. Well, guess what? Not to say we told you so, but it did. Not only did it 
cost hundreds of millions of dollars to fight that fire, burned over 800,000 acres, and cost several lives. A few years ago, we had a big fire in Baxter Park, and that fire went over the boundary and burned, I believe, about 2,500 acres on Great Northern Pier. I'm not sure of that acreage, so I may be wrong on that, but if my memory is right, it's about 2,500 acres that got burned over on Great Northern's paper land. The problem is the National Park Service has a policy that any natural disaster that happens on their land will be allowed to continue to happen until it goes outside the park boundaries. So that means if you go to a national park and you start a fire with your campfire, they're going to go put it out. But if Mother Nature starts it with lightning, they aren't going to put it out because it's a natural occurrence and they let that fire continue to burn until it gets to the park boundary. And that's what happened in, in Yellowstone. They let it burn, but once it got to the, it was, it was too late. They couldn't stop it. And that's what happened at Baxter Park. They let that fire burn until they got the park boundaries. And a lot of people don't believe it, but you look it up. You read the National uh, Park Fire Policy, and they'll tell you that. And they have that same policy on insects and disease. So what this is going to become, this is going to become a cradle for forest fires, insect and disease in the middle of the North Main woods, which will infect the rest of our private landowners. It's another good reason not to have a park. Another problem about a park, no matter what the acreage is, the National Park Service almost always sets up buffers around their parks where they also don't allow timber harvesting. And that's because a lot of the people who go to the national parks or recreate don't want to hear chainsaws and skidders running, so they set up large buffers around them. Again, Yellowstone is an area where they've done that. Roxanne Quimby talks about she wants access to the public, but she's the first big landowner in the state of Maine, except for maybe the government-owned land, to shut out snowmobiles and cut off access to other people's log trucks. She's had a lot of the cabins burned in that area. Uh, the uh, Bowling Pond camps are right across the river, uh, right for that section I showed you, right across the river. I was at Bowling Camps last summer, and I had made the mistake of asking what they thought about the park, and boy, I got my ears lowered, I'll tell you. That, they've had that camp there for about, since the 1800s. They have many, many log cabins. That my folks went there 60 years ago, and uh, they used to tell about hiking up Traveler's Mountain to this little cabin, this nice little pond. Had to hike up six miles with a a donkey carrying their, or a mule carrying their, their gear. So I asked him if we could go up and stay in that cabin. And he says, no, you can't, because Roxanne couldn't be burned it last year. He says, in fact, she used to own our camps here, and she burned, she started to burn our log cabins until the Gardner family traded the township across the river for this township, and that's what saved our camp, or she would have burned a, a whole outfit down. I, I just don't understand why people don't, you know, if these people are gonna go use this path, where are they gonna stay? You know, there's no campgrounds there, there's no hotels there, there's no place for them to stay. And this is a lady that says she wants access, but she's shutting off all the roads and, and burning all the lodging. We have this wonderful tradition of free access in Maine. But you know what? People think they're going to have a national park for access. Access to a national park isn't free either. It will cost you to go to that national park. That whole area now, except for where she owns and Baxter Park, is free. You can go and enjoy almost all the North Main woods for free. You can camp, fish, hunt, fish, snowmobile, whatever you want to do. It costs you nothing. Now, part of the North Woods, they do have a gated access, and they do charge an access fee to help maintain the campgrounds. But it's a very nominal fee. She likes to compare this proposed park to Acadia National Park. And Acadia National Park is absolutely beautiful. Acadia National Park has got roads for access. It's got campgrounds, it's got hotels just outside the park, all around it. It's got <coughs> spectacular scenery. And I'm sorry, but this area has none of the above. And when you make this a national park, you're going to remove it from the tax base, which means everybody else will have to pay more taxes. The National Park Service has no money. It's broke now. It can't take care of what it's got. But she says she's going to raise another $40 million. She's going to give it an endowment. I'll give her due credit. She's going to give it an endowment. But she's going to give it another, she's going to raise another $40 million. Now, I don't know how she's going to raise that. She hasn't told us yet, but I'd be interested to find out how she's going to raise that $40 million. I don't know if it's going to be other government grants or what, but she does, she's pledged to do that. So I don't think that money will be an issue as far as running the pack if it does ever become a pack. But, again, it's going to cost us money, and it's costing us nothing now. And we have tremendous timber production in, in uh, northern Maine on all the land, available to our smells. But, you know, people worry about clear cutting, say, well, there'll never be jobs there, there'll, there'll never be uh, timber jobs there. But you know what, with a national park, a, a, a clear cut grows back, but a national park will be forever, and it will never produce any timber 
for jobs. The, um, another threat is to the paper mills because of emissions. Well, how can that be? Well, my mill is in Sales Mart, Maine, okay, 15 miles from here. And we have a 1,500 horsepower diesel electric unit there for generating power when the power coming in off of the center main power line. If we lose power in a storm, we can start up this big Caterpillar diesel electric unit to keep the mill going so we don't have to send people home. But I can only run that. There's a $200,000 machine sitting there that I can only run 1,200 hours a year because it's within 50 air miles of Acadia National Park, okay? The big paper mills in Millinocket are 25 miles from her pack, her proposed pack. And I can't help but believe that the emissions from that mill are gonna be, the ability to run that mill are gonna be in danger because of the presence of the pack within 25 miles of her mill. Another thing I'd like to talk about is jobs, okay? She talks about it's gonna create jobs in the pack. First of all, mill jobs pay at least double what pack ranger jobs and summer jobs for people working in the packs do. And mill jobs are year round. You know, those, the average salary of the paper mill jobs in Millinocket is over $50,000 a year. The pack jobs will be, you know, just above minimum wage and seasonal jobs, okay? There isn't, a, and the people that sell in t-shirts just don't make the money that people working in the mills do. I'd like to have a consider putting a conservation easement on that land. Uh, we own a big piece of land up around uh, in Township 40. Robbins Lumber Company owns Township 40, which is around West Lake and Nicotowes. Any of you here have been to Nicotowes Lake, Nicotowes Lodge, or West Lake? Nicotowes. Okay, well, we own about two thirds of the property around those two lakes. And a few years ago, we put a 22,000 acre conservation easement on it, guaranteeing access and recreation to the people of the public forever. It didn't cost the Maine people anything. We gave that to the state of Maine, and we gave them 75 islands in those lakes. But in exchange, we own the land, we still pay the taxes, but we'll always have the rights to the timber. So we have the timber to provide the jobs, the state of Maine has the access, it doesn't cost the state of Maine one cent. To me, that's a win-win for everybody. And if she doesn't want development, I understand that. I don't want development on my township, up at Township 40 either. So we aren't gonna have development, but we're gonna have timber jobs, we're gonna have recreation and recreation jobs. I think that's a win-win for everybody. But it's her land, as you said, Bob, she can do anything she wants to, and, um, if she doesn't want to do that, that's fine, that's her property. But I'd like to address just a little bit more the economics of it. This gentleman over here asked about the economics. There's 70,000 acres that she's proposing, okay? The average woodland acre in the state of Maine produces about three-eighths of a cord per acre per year. That's how much wood you grow now. With silviculture, intensive silviculture, I know on some of Irving's land, they produce two cards per acre per year. But statewide, the average is three-eighths of a cord per acre per year, and that's what I'll use tonight. Three acres of cod per acre per year. On 70,000 acres, that land should generate 28,125 cards of wood a year. The average value of that wood is about $30 per cod, okay? You multiply that out, uh, on, um, and that is $843,000 a year stumpage that that should generate to Roxanne Quimby, okay? However, there's a multiplier on this wood, when any wood, whatever the, the stumpage, the landlord gets the stumpage, usually a multiplier of about five times is what that means to the general economy, meaning the, the jobs for the people in there cutting the wood, the people trucking the wood, when that wood gets to the mills, the mill jobs that that supports, and when the mills sell that wood, what they get for it. It's about a five time multiplier. So if you multiply that out, that's about $4.2 million a year that that land should be generating for the main economy based on the forest industry alone. This isn't including anything for recreation. And by the way, the forest industry in the state of Maine is the biggest industry in Maine. It's six billion dollar a year industry. That's six billion, okay? So that should kick out 4.2 million dollars a year generate for the Maine economy. Multiply that times 10, that's 42 million dollars over a 10 year period that that land should generate for the state of Maine. And I believe that that's more profitable for the state of Maine and Roxanne Quimby than the National Park. And we can still have the recreation, we can still have the jobs, we can have it all. So that completes my speech. I'm happy to take any questions. At the moment, uh, okay, um, first of all, on <clears throat> not being here tonight for a debate, the reason we were asked here tonight because their side was here a few months ago and gave their side, and so they asked us to come down tonight and give our side. Oh, okay. And I agree with this should be a debate. Um, I, I'm more than happy to be. I, I've had a debate with her at the Maine Forest Potter's Town. She came in to visit us one day. 
But I don't think there is any compromising with it because I asked her that day. I asked her specifically. I said, Roxanne, if you don't get the national pack, what is plan B? She said, there is no plan B. That was her answer. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a major point in it. Her, her proposal w was given to the National Park Service on November 5th of, of 2011, uh, and it's very specific in what it is going to do. Uh, it, currently, there's 56,000 acres. She's saying that she's going to purchase an additional 19,000 acres. It'll take that total up to 75, 77. It, it kind of it goes back and forth. Uh, and what her plans for that land are are, are very specific. Uh, in that she wants it preserved, she doesn't want it used for hunting and, and, and anything else. Uh, but the numbers don't make sense that she, she gives. Uh, Jim had mentioned the $40 million she had agreed, she's mentioned that a couple times. $20 million for an endowment, $20 million for infrastructure. Uh, well, the infrastructure for any national park, if anybody's going to use it, is going to include you know, roads. National Park Service is the largest road builder in the United States. I don't know if people know that. They love building roads. Uh, you know, and, and any roads that go through that thing are going to have to be the specifications that probably the highway system doesn't meet. Uh, the campgrounds, visitor centers is easily going to go over $20 million. Yet that's all she's providing uh, with this donation is $20 million for infrastructure with a $20 million endowment. Uh, but if you look at the numbers she just gave the federal government, they do not include the $20 million for infrastructure. They, they are $40 million for an endowment, and that's it which only meets about half of the budget requirements that they're projecting for the park. So the numbers on this gift, when everybody says, oh, it's free, it's going to be given to us, the numbers don't make sense. And they're going to be a drag on the National Park Service, which already can't pay its bills. You know, infrastructure and national park systems it is, is falling apart at a rate quicker than they can keep it up. Um, you know, so the area Jim had mentioned a couple times, I, I've been in that area since I was a kid. It's great for fishing you can't see anything from it. The woods are so thick, you cannot see. You get a couple of vision, couple places where you can see Traveler Mountain on the northern section. If you climb a mountain over on the eastern section, you might be able to see Acadia from the very top. I guess Acadia, excuse me, Katahdin. Uh, but for the most part, you can't see anything inside those lands. Um, you know, it's, it's very discriminatory against old people, young people, poor people, handicapped people, because they, they can't get in there, they can't. You know, the wealthy people can afford to hire guides and take them in on horseback or whatever, but the other people can't. But when you hear them start listing inventory items that would make a good park, some of them are 60 to 70 miles away from that park, which brings it back to the larger agenda item of the restore 3.2 million acre park. And if you look at all the quotes <coughs> on these placards on the back, in, in one breath, she says it's only 70,000 acres. I want to limit conversation to this proposal to 70,000 acres. Yet over here, she's talking about a 3.2 million acre park. She sits on a board of an organization. She's the co-chair of Americans for a Maine Woods National Park and Preserve calling for a 3.2 million acre park. That's a part of the problem, is that they want to limit discussion to 70,000 acres, but that's not what it's about. The issue is about a 3.2 million acre land grab that if it takes place is going to suffocate the recreation industry and the woods industry. So, I frankly think that our industry is partly to blame for this because uh, if they wouldn't sell her the land, she wouldn't be buying it. <laughs> uh, I, I think we're partly to blame. She, she'll never buy it for me, I guarantee you that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it would be acceptable to, to more than it is now, but uh, I personally see nothing wrong with it being in, in private ownership, especially if you want to put a conservation easement on it so there's no development. You know, she would get rewarded for that. You know, you get paid for conservation easement. Whatever you give up for rights, you're supposed to get rewarded for, and she would. Uh, and she yeah. could stop development, you could have timber production, you could have the recreation, and it would be controlled by people in Maine, as you say. Yeah, we got a question over here. How many acres of her land have conservation easements and are protected? I don't know. You know. Zero. Zero. I don't, yeah. know. I, don't, I don't think anybody knows that. Not if, if the goal is conservation and protection of this land, as stated on their website, her website, it could be done tomorrow. Not a single acre of 120,000 acres owned by Roxanne, and I have a quote from Mark Leathers, her land manager, she enjoys unencumbered title to her property. Well, as we've heard, that's great. But then don't cry that it's not protected, because it could be. 
there's no preservation of that land now. It could all be protected. The AMC has done it. Plum Creek has done it. The state of Maine has done it. The Nature Conservancy has done it. We're, we're, we've got people crying that the North Woods need to be saved, when in fact, the North Woods have been saved. There's conservation, how many? Yeah, 1.6 1. 1. 6 million. million acres? I, I think the, the fellow in the back a, a great point, and you know it, there's been a lot of rewriting of history over the years. But Governor Baxter's original plan was to buy the land right around Mount Katahdin. At the same time, it was right in the middle of the depression, so he was buying this land right. But during the depression, Senator Owen Brewster from Maine was trying to build a national park there. And his idea was you were going to bring in the Civilian Conservation Corps and create hundreds of jobs building this gigantic park. Baxter was so opposed to that, he started buying more land to protect it from the federal government. And uh, there's a quote from him. He wrote a letter to the editor in the Portland Press Herald back in the late 1930s. He said, I will consider my life's work a total failure if this land ever becomes a national park. Roxanne Quimby took a lot of her, her, her charitable foundation, her arts calling, and everything were divided into three corporate structures. L EPI, or Elliottsville Plantation Incorporated, is what owns her land holdings. Uh, and they very specifically, they have decided that federal protection is in the best interest of all of her land. She, uh, no question, no, no debate. It, in discussions I have had with her, and, and I always, like Jim, what's your plan B? Because, boy, this, this ain't working. And I don't have a plan B. Well, plan B, in my mind at least, Baxter Park. Um, it's iconic. It's Maine. Um, she doesn't like it. I, and, and what she always talks to me about, at least, is it doesn't have the brand, the National Park brand, which is recognized around the world. And I, yeah. If her, if her, if her true agenda is to give it to the people to use in recreation, then all she has to do is step back because it's already that way. The state of Maine is that way now. Every every landowner up there, I guide for a living, so I, I get to go up there and I get to enjoy it, you know, all over the state in different places. And the beauty of Maine, I've been all over the country hunting and, and fishing, and uh, the beauty of Maine is that we have a treasure that people don't realize. Uh, other states, you have to pay to be part of a club to have access to property, mm -hmm. and you have to, you know, uh, be part of some group. And it's a very, it's a, becoming a very, uh, it's a rich man's sport in other places in this country. What we have is is amazing gift right now if we can maintain that uh, as sportsmen. You know, the Sportsman Alliance and all the people in Maine that have gotten together and. Uh, and we've all, we've all been worried about this for ages because it just shows where things could go. And landowners, uh, you see it with uh, the Penobscot tribe is doing similar buying up properties. Uh, guys are stumping it off and they're grabbing it up and getting it. And those uh, properties are also becoming inaccessible. And as you watch all these pieces disappear throughout the state and access becomes more and more difficult, it's, it's, uh, it's concern. Where we have it, the way it is now, I can go anywhere I want, pay a, a, a road use fee to get through that gate, and let them know what I'm up to, and go and do whatever I want to do all day with clients. I can go where I want to go as long as I, as long as I obey the, the rules of the road up there, and as long as I pay my fee in, in the gates when I go in, as long as I'm not belligerent in the use of the property and the landowners don't have a problem with the way I'm using I can do anything I want now for free, it's almost free. I mean for- It's for pretty remarkable. Now. And so why would uh, a promotion of a park, and what Jim says is obvious, I mean, I've been all through there, you can't fall down in those woods, they're so thick. The, you know, uh, why would you, want to make a park and try to draw people in and give federal, uh, the federal government control of that. That's, it's ridiculous when we have everything that she's offering us now. She's trying to give us what we've got and we're going to lose. Uh, your analogy of here's, you know, here's $100, I'm going to give you back 40 You know, we're, 
you know, it sounds so great. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. But we already have it. Why, why are you offering me something I've already got that you're actually taking from me and trying to make it look like you're giving me something? Yeah. On the back table, you'll find the there's the magazines for the Maine North Woods Association. <laughs> Uh, and there's also a map there. There's over 400 campsites within the Maine North Woods that they provide for. Uh, if you grab the Delorme, I'm not a salesman for Delorme magazine, uh, Gazetteer, by the way, but I've used that since I was a kid. I'm probably on my 20th copy of, of a Gazetteer. Uh, they wear out in about two years. Your father, uh, your father actually bought me the plastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he doesn't sell them either. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I can't tell you how much I've used those looking for campsites. You look at those little red teepees that dot the state. The majority of those are free campsites you can go use right now. You make a decision right now and, and draw something on some ponds, go canoe trips. I've done multiple canoe trips all over this state, just going into rivers and lakes and, right. and such. And, uh, a couple of phone calls to the landowners, and you can set up a, a, a wall tent and guide off that property mm -hmm. and use that land for nothing, for a few bucks. Yeah. We, had, we had another question here. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, we've got a plug on the petition. Up back, you'll also find a petition that the Preserve Maine Traditions is starting a petition drive uh, statewide, uh, you know, for all those uh, to show opposition to the, to the idea of a national park. Uh, we have an online petition at, at uh, PreserveMainTraditions.com. Uh, again, our, our goal is that by next fall we'll have a couple thousand on the online petition and maybe five or six thousand on the, the other petition. Those are going to be starting to be uh, passed around the different sportsman shows. Uh, and going out to different guide camps and everything else around the state in the next couple of months. So, so say thank you very much to, to both you. Jim and to Bob for coming. Thank you. Thank you.